I think it's safe to say that the San Diego Chargers had a very, very disappointing 2015 NFL season. Uh, you know, anytime you have a franchise quarterback like Phillip Rivers and you finish 4-12, and that's not good. I mean, not only did they finish last in the AFC West, they finished several games behind the Oakland Raiders for last place in the AFC West. Just not a good year. I mean, maybe some Chargers fans and some members of the media are a little surprised that this team didn't fire uh, head coach Mike McCoy. I could understand why some people might think that that should have happened, but instead they decided to give him a one-year contract extension, which really only means that they're eliminating the lame duck status for him for 2016. But nonetheless, he's on the hot seat. The seat is cooking, and especially if this team starts the season off slowly in 2016, he will be a candidate to be potentially one of the first coaches fired. Uh, one positive out of all of this, though, is that you managed to keep Phillip Rivers healthy the entire year, uh, so there's no long-term ramifications to this season. And the San Diego Chargers franchise got the number three overall pick in the 2016 NFL Draft. Okay. Even in bad, sometimes you can find a way and spin it and make it a positive. So what went well and what went right for the Chargers in 2015 and what didn't? Well, you sit there, you know, like with all the bad teams, and the Chargers most certainly were a bad team this year and definitely one of the worst teams in the NFL throughout the course of the season and definitely merited this number three overall pick. There's not a lot that went well, is what you would say. And, and to be fair, you would be right because there just wasn't a lot that went well. Uh, but they did have some pretty good individual performances. Phillip Rivers... Finished second in the league in passing yards. Now, granted, that was in part because of the lack of a consistent running game. Um, but when you look at the fact that he lost so many pieces on offense throughout the course of the year to injury for extended periods of time or for the rest of the season, guys like Keenan Allen and Malcolm Floyd and Stevie Johnson, you know, you didn't have Antonio Gates the first four games of the season due to the PED suspension. The fact that Phillip Rivers, with the lack of weapons, the lack of a running game, and the lack of a quality offensive line to protect him still finished second in the league in passing yards is pretty impressive. You know, no matter how much you're trying to throw the ball, he was basically towards the end of the year thrown to a bunch of scrubs, if we're being honest, and he had a bunch of scrubs protecting him, and frankly, he was getting some scrub performances pretty much all year out of the running backs coming out of the backfield. So, I, second in the league in passing yards, it lets me know that Phillip Rivers still has it, which is a good thing for an organization that could be looking at a venue change very, very soon that just plunked a bunch of money into Phillip Rivers. You know, the last thing they needed to have happen was Phillip Rivers have a terrible 2015 because now you're looking at a guy in his mid-30s um, with a lot of reputation, a lot of name, and a lot of legacy uh, in terms of individual statistical performance in his background. But where do you go as an organization from here? Well, at least for the time being, you can kick that can down the road a little bit. You had Danny Woodhead. Uh, play well this year in his role as being that kind of versatile weapon out of the backfield. He was a league leader in receptions, receiving yards for running backs out of the backfield. You know, a really reliable weapon for Phillip Rivers in the passing game. One of the few ones he had throughout the course of the season. Woodhead finished with over a 1,000 all-purpose yards, nine touchdowns. Easily the Chargers' best running back in 2015. Not that that says a whole lot. On the defensive side of the ball, you had former first-round pick Melvin Ingram, I think, finally really actually live up to that status of being a former first-round pick with finishing with 10 and a half sacks. Melvin Ingram had a really good year, and that has to be somewhat encouraging for this Chargers organization going forward. A team that's invested high draft picks in the linebacking core, in Melvin Ingram and Jeremiah Taushu and Monte Teo and Denzel Perryman. Now to see somebody like a former first-round pick who had the biggest investment put in him all, all and Melvin Ingram put up 10.5 sacks this year and really just be a quality every-down player to me has to bode well for the future and the future of that defense because at least it removes one question out of the equation. Of course, that is, unless the Chargers just allow him to walk in free agency, then uh, what the hell is the whole point? And then I look at Jason Verrett, too, their second or their first round pick, excuse me, in 2014. If you remember, I was very high on him coming out of TCU, even though he wasn't the biggest guy and he had concerns about his shoulder. I looked at the style of play that he had, and to me, he played like a corner that was six foot two or six foot three, 210 pounds. I mean, he played a lot bigger than his size would indicate. And you saw with Verrett in 2015. You saw a guy that could be a legit number one corner at the NFL level when he was healthy and he's on the field. He's a load, and I like a lot about his game. And again, you combine that with uh, the kind of burst or breakout season that Melvin Ingram had, 
You know, there are some pieces to work with on the defensive side of the ball. Well, let's not get too carried away here. Those Chargers are still a bad team, and they had a really, really bad year, and a lot of things didn't really go well at all. First off, this team just couldn't stay healthy. They got besieged by injuries on the offensive line, besieged by injuries to their wide receiving core. Just not a good formula for success. You know, I don't care how good the quarterback is or not good the quarterback is. If you have that many injuries on the offensive line, that many injuries on the in the wide receiving core, and especially the key notable players like a Keenan Allen, you're going to really, really, really struggle. And it's going to be a tough go of things. You know, so as much as anything else, you can blame injuries for at least part of the Chargers' problems. But, you know, at the end of the day, all teams deal with injuries to different levels of capacities. It hit the Chargers, the injury bug did, more than others this year. But you've still got to find a way to overcome that. And maybe that speaks to lack of organizational depth because 4-12 uh, and 12 is unacceptable, period. Especially when you have a guy like a Philip Rivers as your starting quarterback. Uh, what else didn't go well? Melvin Gordon, their first-round pick this year. You know, Heading into this draft, I thought Melvin Gordon, frankly, was a little bit overrated. I had some concerns about his ability to catch out of the backfield. I had some concerns about his ability to hold on to the football. I thought he showed himself well as a pass catcher out of the backfield at certain times, but he still had the same ball security issues that he had at Wisconsin, and the fit was just really, really poor. Now, again, some of that could be blamed on the offensive line, yes, but Melvin Gordon didn't show a lot of explosion. He didn't show a lot of elusiveness. He didn't show a lot of tackle-breaking ability. It was just a rough go of it and a really rough adjustment for Melvin Gordon in his rookie season. This is a running back you spent a first-round pick on who has picked five picks after Todd Gurley. And it's amazing the gap in performance and production between those two running backs. They must get more out of Melvin Gordon in the future, or else this is going to look like a really disastrous pick for this organization for many, many years to come. Other things that happened. Uh, they didn't have a single win with against a team with a 500 or above record. You know, 4-12, and 12, you probably don't expect a lot of quality victories. This team did not play very well against good teams. And then they also had nine losses by eight or fewer points. Now, you can say that means they were competitive, that they were staying close in games, and, that, and there was something to be said about that. And with all the injuries, this was still a competitive team. This was still a team that was playing hard. They had their moments where they got steamrolled, go see the Chiefs game for one example. They had a lot of other games where they were in it. They had a lot of other games where they had chances to win. Uh, but the bottom line is they didn't get it done at the end of the day. Those are a lot of close losses, but they're still losses. And... Good teams find a way to win those types of games. Bad teams don't, and the Chargers were a bad team. And then you look at the way they've treated Eric Weddle and the way they're basically ready to just move on him, and I feel like they've kind of treated him like, this guy has been a good player for them for many years. You know, this kind of speaks back to the A.J. Smith era of the San Diego Chargers in a lot of ways. You get some good years out of a guy, one of your star players, and then all of a sudden you don't, when it comes time to pony up the dough, you don't want to pony up the dough, and you treat him like crap, and then you allow him to leave, and you get nothing in return. And it looks like the Chargers organization is going to do the same thing again with Eric Weddle. Now, granted, you know, you're talking about a safety about 30 years of age. How much money do you really want to plunk into him? And how valuable was he really for a team that went 4-12 and 12, whose defense wasn't all that particularly good? I get those points, but at the same point in time, he is a very, very talented player. He's one of the best players you have on your entire roster. You don't have a clear, qualified candidate to replace him in the back bullpen, if you will, on the back burner. As a result, is it wise to just continue to allow these types of players to leave all the time without getting any type of compensation in return and without having any qualified replacement in the wings? I mean, that's bitten the Chargers in the ass for many years. So why would you continue to repeat those mistakes of the A.J. Smith era? I just don't know. Now, in terms of the Chargers, their off-season priorities, first and foremost, they got to figure out where the hell they're going to be playing in 2016 and beyond. You know, we assume that they're done in San Diego. Maybe they will play another year in San Diego. Maybe they won't. But they need to figure out where the hell they're going to be, and they need to figure out soon. Because part of an identity of a franchise is not just the ownership, the front office, the coaching staff, the players. It's also where you are. It's also where you play. You know, Being a part of a community, uh, having an identity in terms of where you belong, and feeling like somebody wants you, and you're a part of something. You know, For the San Diego Chargers, if they move to L.A., which all indications will be that it's not a matter of if, but when, and how soon that happens, they need to get there as soon as they can. Is they need to remove that kind of matzo ball away from the organization, because it hovers over like a rain cloud, and that's not a good thing. The next thing they need to do, they need to get healthy. 
The best thing about the offseason coming for the San Diego Chargers is guys can get healthy. You know, guys like Keenan Allen, they can get healthy. Members of the offensive line can get healthy. You know, it's a chance for Phillip Rivers to rest up. You know, they need this offseason really, really badly, if nothing else, just to get healthy again. Because that automatically will help improve this team. But then they've got to find some depth on both sides of the ball, but in particular on the offensive side of the ball, on the offensive line all throughout, and then in the wide receiving core. And because at the end of the day, you're going to ride or die with Phillip Rivers and his successes or failures. And continuing to put him in a situation where he's throwing to wide receivers like Dontrell Inman and Javante Herndon is only asking for trouble. It's a disaster waiting to happen, and you saw the disaster that waited to happen and ultimately did happen in 2015. So ultimately, with the Chargers, with the questions about uh, their coaching situation, at least being temporarily answered, questions still about where they're even going to play in 2016, it's really going to be important for the San Diego Chargers to get things right from a football standpoint this offseason. And that means they're going to have to be good in free agency, even though I don't expect them to be particularly active, meaning they really need to do well in this upcoming NFL draft. And with the number three overall pick, you know, that's a good place to start to have a better chance of being very productive with your draft. You have the chance to get several impact players immediately. And frankly, they need them. They can't just draft for need. But frankly, when you look at this team, you could argue there's needs just about anywhere. Just about everywhere. So at this point in time, the philosophy for this Chargers team at the end of the day is getting good football players. The best players they possibly can, regardless of position, because you can make arguments just about everywhere on both sides of the ball, need help desperately and badly. But in terms of pure needs, I think the number one need for this organization has to be a left tackle. It has to be. Because Phillip Rivers is your dude. That's who you're going to ride or die with. You have to be able to protect him better. You also have to be better in the running game. And the left tackle is one part of improving that run blocking, one part of improving that overall running game. Not only do you have a lot invested in Phillip Rivers, you also invested a lot in Melvin Gordon with that 15th overall pick in the 2015 draft. you got to make sure you maximize the return on that investment. And the only way you're going to do that is by improving the quality of play on that offensive line. So I think left tackle is a huge need. To me, it's their number one need. So sitting there at number three, the San Diego Chargers would probably hope and pray that Larmy Tunsil from Old Miss will fall to them. I don't anticipate that happening, but if he did, he's clearly got to be the choice. It might behoove the Chargers at number three to reach just a little bit in order to get Ronnie Stanley from Notre Dame. Um, they need a left tackle. And at that point in time, I don't think this is a great draft class to begin with. The Chargers probably aren't going to be drafting a quarterback in round one based off the investment they just made in Phillip Rivers. So where they're at, you know, there you could make a little bit of a reach. I don't think Stanley's a huge reach there. What maybe would be better for the Chargers is if somebody like San Francisco got really hard on for Lynch or Goff, one of the quarterbacks, and the Browns took a quarterback at two. And then at number three, uh, teams know that the Cowboys at four may very well go with a quarterback too. You know, we're getting a team like a San Francisco to trade up to the Chargers at three and then the Chargers could peel back to seven would be a really optimal situation, in my opinion. Now, I also think they need a right tackle. Again, they need offensive line. I could sit there and say they need five offensive linemen. I don't care if you're partial to this guy or that guy. The bottom line is their offensive line stunk to high hell, even when it was healthy in 2015, let alone with the lack of depth and talent. So I can say left tackle, right tackle, center, uh, right guard, left guard, DJ Fluker, Chris Watt, be damned, doesn't matter. They need help everywhere. But I think especially with the bookend tackles, left tackle, and then in the second round, could they, if they didn't somehow go with offensive tackle in round one, in round two, could they go with an offensive tackle there? Probably. Who would really fit in that particular situation? Um, maybe somebody like a Jason Sprakes from Indiana, although I'm not sure he would be there. Maybe maybe a Sean Coleman from Auburn would be there. He would make a lot of sense. He would at least, at worst, be a plug-and-play right tackle from day number one. Another huge need for this team, though, has to be the wide receiver position. You had Keenan Allen had some really, really nice moments in 2015. But this is a guy, again, when you look at him, he's coming off of a lacerated kidney. And there's not a whole lot of help in the receiving core around him, especially when you look at Malcolm Floyd's about to retire. So they need some help there. You know, a guy like Will Fuller in round number two would make a ton of sense. Corey Coleman, if he was there in round two, would also make a huge ton of sense. If Laquan Treadwell was a little bit of a better prospect, 
I would make a strong push for the Chargers to actually just say F it and take him number three overall. Or that trade back scenario I talked about, there's a good chance somebody else might take Ronnie Stanley, but the Laquan Treadwell could be sitting there at number seven. And again, he would make a lot of sense for the San Diego Chargers. In the first two rounds of this draft, to me, in some configuration, the Chargers have to address offensive tackle and wide receiver. They have to. Now, they still have needs on the defensive side of the ball, yes, but I think those needs can be addressed a little bit later. They could use some help. On the defensive line, in particular at the end position, when you look at a team that really struggled to stop the run in 2015, it all starts up front. They need to get better there. Obviously, with them letting Eric Weddle probably walk, they're going to need help at safety. They're going to need some depth at corner. But again, this is a decent safety class. So I think they could find an impact starter down the road in rounds three, four, or maybe even five. I think they could find, with the quality of defensive linemen in this draft, they could find an impact uh, three, four end in rounds three or rounds four, maybe even round five. You know, they could find some cornerback depth in the middle rounds of this draft. To me, there has to be an offensive emphasis, an offensive push in this draft, because that's ultimately going to be the identity of your team. If you're the Chargers, you're probably never going to have a great defense. You just need to have a solid one, an adequate one, maybe a good one. But you really, really need to have a really good offense. And the Chargers don't have a really good offense. They lack balance. They lack consistency. They lack um, the ability to protect the quarterback. They lack the ability to open holes in the running game. They lack a running game. Uh, they lack depth and speed and talent, frankly, at the skill-making positions. They need help all over the place on the offensive side of the ball. You've got Philip Rivers. You've got an offensive-minded head coach. That, to me, is where the emphasis should be in this 2016 NFL draft for the San Diego Chargers.